I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading this morning is from 1 John chapter 3. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them, and by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. Last month, Josh and I took a rather quick vacation to Washington, D.C. We immediately get off the plane and we head to the National Mall, where we proceed to take hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Oftentimes, we had to ask the person next to us, a complete stranger, to take our photo so we could both be in it together. Uh, little did we know that this method of photography is actually old school. Yeah. The cool and hip way to take your own photo is called a selfie. Yeah, some of you ask, what is a selfie? Well, let me show you. Basically, you take your phone, put it on camera mode, make sure the camera is facing you because it's all about you, and then whatever you want in the background, you're going to turn around, yes, I'm doing this, and you're going to smile. Make sure you're at the forefront. Sorry, my big red hair is blocking y'all. And then you take a photo of yourself. How interesting. Huh, well, selfies are exclusive photos. You can really only get a handful of people in them at a time. Selfies are only a small symptom of a more complex cultural self-centeredness. Cell phones combined with social media can keep you physically focused inwardly instead of seeing the people around you. Did you know that cell phones could potentially cause you internal damage? Mm -hmm. When you're on the phone, texting, tweeting, Instagramming the photo I just took, you're normally in a crunched or slumped position of the body. 
your shoulders fold in, your back humps, and the head droops down into your chest. This positioning of the body can create internal issues, closing off the heart and compressing vital organs. There is medical proof that poor posture leads to a number of internal complications like breathing difficulties, heart problems, or even some stomach issues. From selfies to phone postures, we can all easily become exclusive, closed off to the world around us. But this is not how we were created to live. We were created to live and to love beyond ourselves. In the first John passage we read, we hear a warning to a group of first century believers. John is stressing the importance of opening your heart to love. They, too, are struggling with the tension of closing themselves off from the world around them. We, along with these early Christians, are called to open our hearts, deepening our love not only for God, but for our brothers and sisters. I have to tell you that my original title for this sermon was The Bowels of Love, because this is a visceral love. Now I know we could easily go into some graphic metaphors, but don't, don't worry, we won't go there. George has taught me that you have to be here 25 years before you can use a bathroom illustration. <laughs> On Easter. Um. <laughs> However, metaphors come from literal experiences. Here in this passage, the word heart in the Greek is a reference to the deepest inner parts of one's body the bowels, or the guts. This is where we are moved by love, moved by compassion in both truth and action. Verse 17 says, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Another translation reads, And yet closes their hearts against them. We cannot close off our hearts. We must keep open the passageway for love to pull within our innermost being, reaching out to those around us. We cannot live cowardly lives, focused only inwardly. Rather, we are called to a courageous love like Christ Jesus. We were created to love from the inside out. We need to live with a gutsy love. When we let God's spirit of love move freely through the deepest parts of our beings and our hearts, we become open. But when we do not love like Christ, our lives become inwardly focused. Our insides are closed off. When we refuse to help our brothers and sisters, our love becomes gutless. The way we were created is manipulated by the sickness of selfishness. This is what John calls the condemnation of the heart, a sickness of the soul. So what does this mean? There's something deep within our being that protects the goodness within us. We were created good to do good, and our deepest being sends us warning signs when we do not love. This type of sickness sounds the alarm that something is wrong. The sickness of the soul can be caused by guilt, shame, and worst of all, hate. We cannot fully love when our hearts are condemned sick with hate. We were created to love, but like a foreign parasite to our bodies, hate begins to attack the love within us. Eugene Peterson interprets this effect of this internal disease as 
God's love disappearing. John uses murder as a metaphor for the destructive nature of hate. Where love gives life, hate deprives. There's an old African practice of justice. When a family has been afflicted by murder, the murderer, the killer, is tied up and thrown into the local river. It is here that the family is given two choices. On the one hand, they could let the murderer sink to death, or on the other hand, they could save in, save him, jump into the river, knowing that this person has killed their loved one. In complete honesty, I do not know what my response would be. Perhaps nobody fully knows how he or she will respond, whether with love or with hate, until the moment arises. I do know that the first option deprives life, and the other gives life, not just for the murderer, but also for the victims. Hate is similar to love. They both are all-absorbing, all-consuming. Where love thrives, hate revels. Love is also a complete loss of self. But with love, you then somehow mysteriously end up finding yourself more fully. Hate only leads to the complete loss of self. Hate is the ultimate consuming passion. This consuming passion of hate can be contagious and destroy the lives of thousands. While we were in D.C., we visited the Holocaust Museum. Just walking through the exhibits revealed the power of hatred. It really made me sick to my stomach. The horrible stories of torture, betrayal, and death covered the walls of every room. Hate is a powerful feeling that disturbs our mind and disrupts our being. They have a temporary exhibit up right now called Some Were Neighbors, Collaboration and Complicity. This exhibit was all about those who assisted in the persecution and murder of their Jewish neighbors, co-workers, and friends. These individuals drank the poison of Hitler's hatred. They could not find the courage to love beyond themselves, acting against the powers of hate. For love is more than just a feeling. It implies action. This action can even occur when the feeling of love is not even present. As a feeling, love cannot be commanded but it can if it is an action. We are commanded to love God and to love others. The law of love calls us to live sacrificially. This is how we live out compassion. For compassion is an internal pulling towards the needs of others. We are benefactors or fiduciaries of Christ's love. Therefore, we follow Christ's acts of compassion, his sacrificial love. We, too, are called to lay down our lives in the name of love. But let's think logically about this. If you are willing to fully give yourself, even your life, in the name of love, then you should logically be willing to do lesser acts of service. We see that Christ is our paraclete or our advocate. If we follow the love of God, we also are advocates for others. This morning, Wilshire commissioned Stephen ministers, and I have the privilege of being one of them. We have trained since January, and we join 95 other Stephen ministers. Hmm. Stephen Ministry is all about supporting, encouraging, and advocating for individuals. There are people in our community who need to see love in action. 
Stephen ministry imparts the love of Christ through ongoing, caring relationships. This is the church. The church who is the body of Christ and is called to love by means of sacrificial living. We are advocates for those who cannot advocate for themselves. There are too many churches prioritizing their reputations over people. This world is full of hate that has affected others in horrible and inhumane ways. Whether we're speaking about the terrorist acts or maybe even about the domestic violence that's going on in our own neighborhoods. There is a greater need for advocates today. More women were killed in the past 50 years because they were women than men were killed in the wars of the 20th century. Who will find the courage to love and live sacrificially in the face of so much hatred? As you leave the Holocaust Museum, there's a quote above the exit door. It's from a Lutheran minister named Martin Niemöller, who was actually an early Nazi supporter. He says, first they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out, for I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out, for I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. When we choose not to act in love, we allow hate to creep its way further into our world. Hate, like murder, takes away life in one form or another. So how does God's love abide in our world? It's because of those who courageously choose to love in truth and action. The church is this community that is galvanized for love and compassion. Like a steel pipe, the church is dipped into the hot liquid of Christ's sacrificial love, making us resistant to the corrosions of hate. This is a messy pr process. But when is love not messy? Love is never forced onto a person and therefore cannot be neat and orderly. Love is a choice of free will, like Christ going to the cross, going to his death and resurrection. This love takes guts. Loving our brothers and sisters is a validation of us having passed from death to life. Eternal life is not future survival beyond the grave, but a reality for those within the community of love. Everyday love is eternal life. This is not once-in-a-lifetime heroism, but everyday attention to the basic needs of those around you. For the month of April, Wilshire has been recognizing individuals within our community who have been serving Pictures of them have been posted on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Here are some of the uploads. Jason grilled hot dogs for children on a mission trip in Shaw, Mississippi. The Gunthree kids collected canned goods for their Wilkinson Center birthday party. Judy is starting up a cooking ministry at City Square. This everyday love is not a love only for the desirable, the beautiful, or those worthy of love. This love doesn't seek to possess another. Neither is it a friendship love based on admiration and compatibility. This love is agape love. God's unmerited love for us that we express towards one another. This love seeks to improve, to bless, and to grant happiness. Last week, George encouraged us to walk as mature Christians, 
as sons and daughters of the light. Like love, we can't see light itself. We can only see what light lights up. Love is only recognized by how it radiates through action. Let's not talk about love or even sing about love if we are not willing to make it real. For this love comes from within, from the inside out. This love will move you beyond the pew and out of this building into the world in which you dwell. It is here that you love in action. Today, take courage. Live life radiating the gutsy love of Christ. Amen.